The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Some Pharisees came and tested him by saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was, <clears throat> it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote to you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. If she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God is like a little child, <clears throat> like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. As many of you know, we are working through a preaching series this fall. And the series is entitled The Marks of the Church. You can see on the front of your bulletin the graphic that we have to indicate that it's all about this second chapter of the book of Acts where it describes what the church looked like. These early Christians who didn't even call themselves Christians at that point. They were followers of the way. What was their community like? Well, there were four characteristics. They devoted themselves. They clung to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And we look at this and wonder if we too might bear those same marks so that we can be the people of God. We've done two Sundays on the apostles' teaching, talking about who Jesus is and how we respond to that. We've done one Sunday on fellowship, and so now this is fellowship part two. Just to remind ourselves a little bit about what Father Todd talked last week about with fellowship part one, is that we have things in common. Uh, a fellowship is a group of people that have things in common. A and what do we have in common? Well, most certainly our redemption through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the glue that binds us together, as Father Todd was saying last week. We also have in common um, this place. It's been entrusted to us. I have two stories to talk about this notion of holding things in common. And the stories are slightly different, so uh, I'll tell both, and, and we'll sort of keep track of it in our heads. So the first story is something that happened to me as I was living in Washington, D.C., going to seminary, and I had a friend who was a monk. He was a Roman Catholic monk in the Paulist order, and his name was Craig. Well, one day, Craig invited me on a tour of his monastery, St. Paul's College near Catholic University. And we were walking up the steps to this beautiful college, this beautiful building, and Craig explained to me that the monastery previously owned uh, much more land around the surrounding area, but that they had to sell it in recent years. Well, Craig knew that I knew exactly what he was talking about, and so I said, oh, uh, because of the lawsuits. And I knew that he knew exactly what I was talking about. We were both talking about the lawsuits coming out of the sexual abuse scandals in the Roman Catholic Church, which is still such a, a painful chapter uh, in the history there. And so he said simply, yes, we pay for our sins, don't we? And I stopped him right there on the steps because I said, Craig, well, they're not your sins. And he said, when I became a member of this order, when I took my vows, they became my sins, too. That's the first story, Craig and I walking up the steps to the monastery. The second story involves a mother who was trying to tell her children about heaven and hell. The kids kept asking her, what are heaven and hell like? And she came up with this illustration to tell them. She said, in heaven and hell, people eat at long banquet tables. Some of you may have heard this before. And each person has spoons, long wooden spoons, attached to their arms from the shoulder all the way down to the tips of their fingers. 
strapped to their arms such that they can't bend their elbows. There is a plate of delicious, hot, steaming food in front of each person, and the people in hell are hungry and miserable because, try as they might, they can't manage to scoop food and get it to their mouth. The people in heaven, on the other hand, who have the same spoons, are satisfied and joyful because, well, they just feed each other across the table. This is how the mother was explaining to her children the idea of heaven and hell. Both of these stories have a meeting point, don't don't they? And and it's things in common. You know, what does it mean when we are given something and hold it in common? The the second story uh, involves food being held in common. It's not my food, it's all of our food, and we share it as we serve one another. The first story is actually a negative, isn't it? Craig saying that the sins of the community were held in common. You might disagree with his interpretation, but it's a a fascinating point. What do we have in common here at St. Mary's? Well, this place, this community, this St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Stewart, Florida, on this location for 50 years and in Stewart itself for over 80 years, has been entrusted to us as a body, as a group of people, as a fellowship of Christians to care for it, to participate in it, to be part of this fellowship of Christians at St. Mary's Episcopal Church. And indeed, it is a household that we're part of. This is how we arrive at this uh, second chapter of Ephesians, which is our reading number two for today. And I'm going to be preaching off of this text. So if you'd like to open up your leaflet, you can find the second reading, which is Ephesians chapter two. And St. Paul is talking about this Christian community and what it's like. And if we kind of skip down to verse 19, we can see, he says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by the Spirit. If that last verse sounds familiar, it might be because you saw it on the Our Father's House graphic, which is the theme for our homecoming dinner and sort of the theme for homecoming this year and looking ahead to 2013. That's where we get this whole notion of Our Father's House, the church as a house our house, but also God's house, or more importantly, God's house. And so that verse, in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling place for God who lives by the Spirit, is right under the graphic. Um, There is, of course, a danger in here, because the church as a house is a powerful metaphor, but we have to always remember that the church is not about buildings. It's about people. Um, You know, I love looking at church websites, and you can find out a lot about a church (coughs) by clicking around its website for, you know, a minute or two. And every once in a while, I come across a website and sort of click through it, and it looks terrific. They've got a great layout, lots of great information, lots of great pictures, stained glass windows. And I realize, though, after about a minute of clicking through, I haven't seen a single picture of a person. I'm pleased to say that when you go to St. Mary's website, which we all should be doing on a weekly basis, you see lots of pictures of people. Because the church is not about walls and windows. It's about us. It's about human beings. Even though we are entrusted these beautiful buildings to care for and maintain for the next generation. Um, You know, St. Paul says it better than I can in verse 19. You are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. So the church is a group of people. The church is a house because it's a group of people, a fellowship of human beings, and then St. Paul is comparing that fellowship to a house being built. It took me all week to get this straight in my head, so I'll say it again. The church is not a house, but the church is a group of people, a fellowship of Christians, And then St. Paul is comparing this fellowship of Christians to the building of a house. So let's go ahead and take a look at that analogy. That shows up in verses 21 and 22. So if you're following along, it's right at the end of the paragraph. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling place 
in which God lives by the Spirit. Two thoughts on this, two bits of analysis on these verses. The first involves grammar. If you take a look at the tense of some of these verbs, in verse 22, you two are being built together. And then in verse 22, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple. These are present tense verbs. Uh, some of them are in the passive tense, some of them are in the active tense, but they're all in the present, such that a church, a community of believers, is not something which is ever finished. It's not something which is ever done. It's not something that's ever a completed product. You have to think of a house being, being built. It is a work in progress. Uh, if you look at this word rises, uh, the Greek word for that rises actually is translated in other spots as to grow. And so when you think of uh, a crop rising from the ground or a tree rising from the ground, it's growing from the ground. Um, in the same way that a house or a building kind of rises from the ground, if you've ever seen a, a sped up movie of, of a barn being built or something. So it, it's, an, it's an active tense, it's a present tense, it's something that is happening. And lo and behold, here at St. Mary's, it's an exciting time because God, each week, is sending new people into our fellowship. In fact, we've had to start creating some more sophisticated new members and welcoming visitors procedures because of what God is doing by sending people into our midst, such that this community is growing. It's not a finished product, it's a work in progress. And people are being added to our numbers. It's something that I hope you all uh, pray for and participate in, this idea of welcoming newcomers and incorporating new members, because this is how the house is rising and growing as a present reality. Let's not forget it. I said I was going to make two uh, analytical points about these verses. Uh, so the first one uh, I just said. The second one has to do with the word temple. See, at the end of verse 21, uh, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Our eyes might just glaze right over that language. Sounds like rather regular kind of Bible language, holy temple in the Lord. Yeah, okay, that, that sounds about right. We have to transport ourselves a little bit back to the hearts and the minds of the people living in first century Christianity, living in the time of the apostles, having come out of this Jewish context and starting the church. When they heard the word temple, it would have leapt off the page to them. Because there was no such thing as a temple, there was the temple. It was the temple in the center of Jerusalem. And it was the heart and soul of Jewish worship for Jews all over the world to come and be the center point of their life together, the temple in Jerusalem. And so whenever they heard that word, that's what they would think of. This was the temple that had been established by David and King Solomon. It had stood the test of time, even having been destroyed by the Babylonians, but then rebuilt and beautified under Herod and expanded. And it was indeed a, a glorious monument. But again, we have to further transport ourselves back to their understanding because we might be thinking of it just as a really beautiful building and a really wonderful center of praise and worship. They thought of it as that as well, but they went further. And they understood the temple to be the very dwelling place of God. They said, in the temple, God's presence abides here on earth. Sometimes we think of heaven and earth being so far apart and separated by great chasms, but they understood that there are times and places where heaven and earth quite literally come together and are joined. And they said that the place where that most clearly happens, where heaven and earth become one, is the temple. The temple in Jerusalem, the very presence of God living and dwelling in that place, heaven and earth coming together. So it's temple with a capital T, and it would have been striking and exciting for these early Christians then to hear, you, your community, your fellowship, your little slice of community together in our Lord Jesus Christ is a temple. The very presence of the living God, heaven and earth, are coming together in you, 
and your little community of fellow Christians. It's a big difference. I was trying to think of a modern day analogy and I started pondering this idea of embassies or consulates. There are embassies and consulates of foreign countries uh, here in America and also American embassies in every foreign capital across the world. So if you were in Moscow, for example, you would be in this place where it was a different language and there were different customs and different cultures and different foods. But if you managed to find your way into the American embassy and talked your way in there, suddenly you would be in a place <coughs> where people were speaking your language, where people were practicing your American customs. You might even find some American food. And indeed, I've been told that one of the best parts of an American embassy is the commissary, where you can get a jar of Skippy peanut butter or a box of Kellogg's Frosted Flakes, even though you're 2,000 miles away from the United States. And so it is that an American embassy is not just um, technically American soil, but it looks and feels like American soil. We know that if somebody's born in an, uh, an American embassy, they are an American citizen. But you feel like somehow you've stepped back into your home country when you go to an embassy because it's American territory. And so it is that the church is not just a religious club, but what we are doing as part of building up this house, that is the church, is establishing territory for God. We are establishing this place as an embassy of God Almighty here on earth. And we are inviting God's presence to live in this place, and we are inviting all to come and see that this is a little bit of what it looks like to have heaven on earth, because this is God's house God's territory, God's embassy, such that if somebody wanted to learn about God, if somebody wanted to know what Christ is all about, if somebody wanted to see what is Christianity, we wouldn't just tell them. We would say, come and see. Come and walk around in this community. Come and talk to people. Come and participate in our mission and ministry. Come and participate in our fellowship. And they will see, oh, this is who God is. This is who Jesus is. This is how Christianity is revealed in this fellowship. Sometimes when we think of fellowship, we just think of being really nice to each other and being loving and supportive and empathetic and compassionate toward one another. And that's absolutely an important part of who we are as Christians. There's far too much meanness out there in the world, meanness at the workplace and bitterness, far too much meanness at our schools unfortunately. There's far too much meanness and bitterness on Highway 95 or the Florida Turnpike. It is indeed a, a respite and, and a glorious thing that this place can differentiate itself from that in the kindness and compassion that we show for one another, and most especially in the kindness and compassion we display to newcomers and visitors and new members as they are incorporated and welcomed over an abundant welcome to our newcomers and visitors here at St. Mary's Church. These are all marks of what it means to be a compassionate Christian fellowship. But let's not fall into the trap of thinking that that is an end in and of itself, a group of people being nice to each other. Christian fellowship, the kind of fellowship that the apostles were devoted to, that they clung to, was nothing short of creating territory for God, a place where God might live and breathe and the very presence of God might reside. Through our fellowship, through how we participate together in our shared mission and ministry, holding this place common, we are establishing day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, an embassy for God Almighty. And so it is that we are told that we are a house. We are being built into a house. And in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. May it be so.
Amen.